In the late 1940s, India and China won independence from colonial rule. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. While the trajectories of their respective freedom movements were quite different, there was one remarkable similarity. Both broke up into two enemy nations apiece, China, Taiwan, India, Pakistan. For seven decades now, these pairs of estranged siblings have stayed implacable foes. But you know, as China closed in on superpower status, it dehyphenated from Taiwan without lessening its hostility towards that country. China is now America's global rival and not Taiwan's principal adversary. Pakistan. 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 Unfortunately, India has remained fixated on Pakistan, even as our economic heft has multiplied manyfold. This must change. A country's standing in world affairs is defined by who its primary competitors are. India must raise its gaze from Pakistan without, of course, lessening its chokehold, yet diminishing the high-pitched, sort of overt importance we give it in our foreign policy narrative. In fact, um, if you ask me, it's time to move out of the emotional ravines of history. For all our uh, economic engagement, there is surprisingly very little contact between ordinary Chinese and Indian citizens. Uh, our populations remain quite deeply suspicious of one another, uh, locked into a very media fueled uh, stereotype. Uh, for instance, according to a 2016 Pew survey, uh, only 26% of Chinese expressed a favorable view of India. And that was down uh, 7 percentage points from 2006, with more than 60% holding a negative uh, view. Indians, for their part, don't trust China's uh, economic or strategic intentions. A parallel uh, 2016 Pew survey found that only 31% of Indians had a favorable view of China, with nearly 70% citing both Chinese military power and its territorial incursions as a somewhat or oh, very serious problem for India. But in many ways, uh, India's engagement with China, as with the uh, United States, has deepened and matured in recent years. Uh, the two countries have signed uh, bilateral agreements on everything from cultural exchanges to joint uh, military patrols. In 2016, they even staged their first army exercises in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which focused on humanitarian aid, uh, disaster relief and counter-terrorism operations, uh, but also were clearly designed to foster trust uh, along the uh, India-China border. China and India also see eye to eye on several uh, geopolitical issues as uh, recently emerged economies far from the centers of Western power. India and China share a basic disillusionment with the Bretton Woods institutions that have shaped uh, global economics since the end of World War II. That has led to collaboration on creating such alternatives as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank AIIB and the BRICS uh, New Development Bank, NDB. We've also found uh, uh, common ground on environmental issues, whether uh, it's sharing oceanic and atmospheric research or holding the developed world to a higher standard in reducing greenhouse gases. We've uh, even collaborated uh, at the Paris Climate Accord. I also have one more, uh, what you could call a, a contrarian view. I believe uh, India should uh, be part of uh, the One Belt, One Road or OBOR or as it's now called BRI uh, initiative. You know, otherwise uh, we risk growing stagnant and isolated in an increasingly connected Asia. But with OBOR or BRI, India can overhaul its woeful infrastructure, create jobs and explore vital new trade avenues in China uh, and South Asia. Beijing has uh, already indicated it is open to making concessions on OBOR through uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Elsewhere, we should push to co-brand OBOR, uh, becoming an official sponsor of the initiative in our neck uh, of the woods. Of course, um, we should negotiate hard 
on the financial terms of the engagement, uh, avoiding the debt trap that several smaller economies who signed up for OBOR have fallen into. We now, of course, have the wisdom of hindsight to guide us in doing that. Uh, we should also use the trade deficit uh, with China to create uh, fair terms of trade, demanding easier access for our exports. And if uh, Beijing refuses to comply, we should uh, not hesitate to implement retaliatory tariffs or bans, uh, for instance, in, in, in pharmaceuticals. We should use access to a vast uh, domestic market, uh, that's for China's glut of uh, steel, cement and uh, other commodities, as a smart negotiating asset. India is also an attractive alternative for nervous Chinese mainland investors. Uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Xiaomi, uh, they've all committed hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, even the controversial Huawei uh, uh, Technologies is keen to power our uh, 5G networks. Uh, Chinese appliance makers, Hired, Media and Konka uh, are also either launching or expanding their presence in India. There is um, unexplored potential in high-speed rail lines, smart cities and uh, joint technology parks. Now, China understands transactional diplomacy. We uh, too should do that. Now, uh, wh while we don't want to antagonize China, we shouldn't be its uh, doormat either. I mean, that means uh, we must remain ever nimble, treating China alternately as a peer, a partner and an adversary. Uh, and all of that uh, depends on the circumstances.